welcome everyone to Williams. Um, before we get our worship service started, there are a couple of announcements you need to know about. And the first one's going to come from our beautiful Patsy Boozer. So come right on up here. We've been trying to do that for years. Um, and I have some very uh, sporadic notes on a little scrap of paper, so bear with me. Um, the Relay for Life team wanted to um, think, we were trying to think of a way to honor Roy's memory. So we've decided to um, come up with a, a t-shirt and Nikki has drawn us a, a beautiful design. It's a musical, I think it's called a staff. Is that what that, the, the, the lines with the big thing? I, I'm, not, I'm not a musician, but anyway, in, in, in the staff, it's gonna say Team Roy um, on, the, on the shirt and these words, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And that's Psalms 118.24. And as you all know, that was one of Roy's favorite ways to begin a worship service here at Williams. The shirts will be red. That was Roy, according to Eva, that was Roy's favorite color, not Eva's favorite color. She doesn't <laughs> like red, so we're going to do red anyway <laughs> to on, honor Roy. Um, after church today, we have a short amount of time to get this done. Um, so we're going to be taking orders today through April 22nd. The shirts will be $10. Make your checks payable to First Baptist Church of Williams because some of the money will go um, to pay for the shirt and some of the money will go for Relay for Life. So we, we need to put it all in uh, First Baptist Church. Of course, we'll take cash. That's, that's always great, too. Um, so Carol and I will be um, down front after church today uh, taking orders and we'll have them available in all sizes, children and adult. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, also, we are continuing to sell luminaries and um, what's that other thing called? <laughs> Torches, yes, <laughs> luminaries and torches, and there are forms available in the foyer for those. So um, just um, order your T-shirts and, and continue to help support Relay for Life, which is coming up um, May 8th at uh, Oxford High School Football Stadium. Okay, thank you. Thank you, beautiful. Oh. Um, Everyone else, grab your bulletins and open them up. Hopefully you have them open and ready to go. There's a lot going on at Williams. It always it's that, seems that way. Um, so make sure that you read over, front and back. Um, but there's just a few things I need to remind you of. Tonight, make sure that you come to evening worship. We will continue our book study. And that will start at 6 o'clock and we'll meet in here. And if you're thinking, oh, book, I haven't read, I haven't even started, that doesn't matter. Um, we discuss each chapter on, on the Sunday night. So you are all invited to come. Afterwards, youth, we will have snack. Um, so keep that in mind. Wednesday night, make sure you come back for service. But if you're in the children's ministry, then you need to be here at 530 for a meeting. And that will be in the senior adult room. And then service will start at 6.30, Bible study will. And then one last thing that's not in the bulletin, next Sunday here in our CMC, there will be a reception to honor Coach Davis from Pleasant Valley. He's retiring as head coach of football. So we're going to have a shindig for him. So all of former players, cheerleaders, coaches, parents, all of you are invited to come, and that will start at 2 o'clock next Sunday afternoon. So remember, read front and back, important information, okay? So now it's time for you to stand on your feet and find someone to give love into. Say good morning to someone.
Well, good morning again. Good to see all of you here as we've gathered for worship together on this second Sunday of Easter. And as we've come together, would you join me in a word of prayer? Great God, we are so thankful. Lord, we always enter this place with thankful hearts. But Lord, we know that you have met us here. God, whatever burdens we carry, whatever troubles may darken our way, Lord, we know that your light has joined us in this place to bring illumination to the love that you share for us. So God, we pray as we have gathered for worship, God, that the offering we bring, Lord, in our songs and our prayers and our gifts, the giving of our hearts, that those offerings may be pleasing to you, Lord. That we will have ears to hear your word being among us, God that we will be responsive in whatever ways you may call us to be. So, Lord, help us this morning to worship as you are here with us, to recognize your presence, and to worship you. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Today's uh, scripture call to worship is Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, and there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Suppose Just suppose God searched through heaven He couldn't find one willing to be the supreme Sacrifice that was needed That would buy eternal life for you and me Oh, had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary Had it not been for the old rugged cross Had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be long. But I'm so glad He was willing to drink his bitter cup. Although he prayed, Father, let it pass from me. Oh, I'm so glad he didn't call heaven's angels. From my hands, pull the nails that torment me. Oh, had it not been for a man called Jesus, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost then forever my soul would be 
First hymn is morning is hymn number 252, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Please stand as we sing uh, both verses. Next to him is uh, 345, Blessed Assurance. Let's sing all three stanzas.
I was, I was going to sit there. <laughs> That's okay. I'll sit over there, and I'll just take my stuff and go over there. <laughs> Watch out. Don't let me drop these. Don't let me drop them. Okay. Thank you. All right. I need to know who's the strongest one of you. Okay. Ada, when you, and then Caleb seems to be hesitant. All right, Coco and Ada, you guys come up. Since you raise your hands. Come on, I want you to stand up here. Stand up in front of me. Okay. Show me your muscles. Show everybody your muscles. Show everybody behind you. Let everybody behind you see, because I'm a little scared right now. Okay. All right. Now hold out your hands like this. And stand up here. Face everybody. I want everybody to see, okay? Now, Ada, I'm going to hand you a book, okay? Can you hold it just like that? All right, Coco, I'm going to give you one, okay? These are big, boring preacher books. Okay, you got it? Is that heavy? Not yet? Okay. Can I give you another one? That one's a little bit bigger. You got it? Okay. Can you hold another one, Coco? I promise I'm... Coco's going to fall over. Oh, you got it? You got it? You got it? Do you need some help? Do you need some... You don't need any help? You got it? Do you need any help, Ada? You good? Okay. Can I give you another book? Oh, oh, oh. Somebody come help Coco. Somebody come help her. Come on, Evan. Come help. Can you take one more? You're being strong. You got it? Yeah. Mm. Do you need help? You sure? It's hard to pick them up. Somebody, do you need some help? Yeah, I just need There you go. No, no, this is good. It's hard for me. Okay, do you want to hold one and you want Coco to hold one? Uh huh. Ada, you want somebody to help you? Somebody come help Ada. Stand up. Okay, you hold that one. Okay, you got that better? Okay. All right, Samuel, now you get to hold another one. Okay, th these are older, boring preacher books. You got that one? Can you take another one, you think? Mm-hmm. You guys think you can hold another one? Yeah. All right, Caleb, you think it's come, you, you come hold one. I'm running out of books. This is, this is not heavy. This is my last one. All right, who wants it? I want it. it. I want you want it? I want it. Okay. I tell you, you just get to hold the bag and everything. How about that? <laughs> All right. Now, how many books is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Do any one of you think you can hold all eight books together? Yes. No, no, not really, right? Yeah. But together you can hold them all, right? Okay, I'll take them back. Here, you can sit them right here on the pew, okay? Okay. Good job, Ada. I think Ada is the strongest tired. person, yeah. <laughs> See, <clears throat> life's like that, guys. Like, sometimes we think we can handle everything, but we need people to help us. We need each other to help us. And so... I want you to think about that. Next time stuff is hard, it's like those heavy books, right? They get real heavy. But we have people that come and help us. And sometimes you can be that person like Caleb came and helped, like Avi helped Coco, like Samuel helped Ada. And God wants us to do that. He, he asks us all. We can't do stuff by ourselves. We can't do everything by ourselves. And God wants us to rely on each other and on him. So can you remember that? Think about those heavy books next time, okay? Well, I want to pray with you when we go to children's church, all right? So let's pray together. God, we thank you so much again for these kids and the ways they teach us, Lord. And we thank you that we get to be just involved in your movement in their lives. And I pray that you go with them to Children's Church, be with those who are with them, and help us, Lord, to just see you as they see you more each day. We pray these in your name. Amen. Thanks, guys. hymn this morning is hymn number 306 Jesus saves we'll sing the first second and four stanzas please stand as we sing
May we pray? Father, we come to you today to praise you and thank you for all the many blessings that you give us every day. We thank you for this day of worship that you have given us and this house to worship in. We thank you for everyone here who bless us by helping us to do your work. And now's the time for us to give a portion of those purchase blessings back to strengthen our church. And as we do it, may we give it with cheerful hearts and in knowing that it will strengthen our church and make us more able to do your will. This is Jesus' precious name we play. Amen. <laughs>
Lord be with you. And Jeannie, I remember how many books are in that stack. So don't get no ideas. <laughs> well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I invite you to join with me in turning to the first epistle of John, first John chapter one. <clears throat> we'll be reading verses one through chapter two, verse two there. First John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, reading on through chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that your joy, our joy, may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him while we are walking in darkness, we lie. And do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and His Word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. May God add His blessing to the reading in hearing of his word. Would you pray with me? Lord, now we pray that you give us ears to hear, eyes to see the things that you have for us. May we see you, may we hear your words, while all other words and distractions fall away. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I don't need any help. I can do, can do it all by myself. When we're kids, that can be kind of a cute sentiment, right? I mean, you're sitting in the living room and you hear the toilet flush, and then they come in the living room. I didn't need any help. I went to the potty all by myself. Then you're a little worried about what you're going to find when you go in the bathroom. Or when the kids come walking in on Sunday morning, ready for church in their Halloween costume, their rainbow striped socks and rubber boots. And they say, I didn't need any help. I got ready for church all by myself. And as we get older, it becomes sort of an expectation. Our parents don't wake us up to get ready for school in the morning. They don't, or in some cases they just can't help us with our homework anymore. 
They don't drive us to practice. We get a license. We can drive ourselves. We can drive to club meetings. We can go to friends' houses. We don't need help to do those things anymore when we're teenagers. Then as adults, we're expected to, to depend less and less on other people. We don't need help from our parents. We don't need help from our friends, from our neighbors, and we had better not need any help from the government. We're taught that pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps is an admirable trait, that being successful, self-sufficient adults is the ultimate goal in life. We perpetrate the myth of the self-made man because our culture has taught us we're not supposed to need any help. We're not supposed to rely on anybody because if you do, that's a sure sign of weakness. I don't need any help. I can do it all by myself. That's, in a way, become a mantra of our existence. Now, you know how I know that's true? And how I know that you know it's true? Think about this. How many of you right now in this room have an aging parent or a grandparent who refuses to admit that they're getting old, that they can't see like they used to, that they can still drive? That they don't need to depend on somebody else to come to the house and clean up, to pick up after them, to pick them up and take them to the store, to take them to the pharmacist, to take them to church. But a lot of you have somebody like that. Or how many of you would rather do something on your own, tackle the job by yourself, even if it means that after you fail so many times, you wind up with a bigger mess than when you started? Our culture has sort of hardwired us into thinking that total independence is the true mark of a well-rounded, successful person. And this way of thinking has even sort of leaked itself into what it means to have faith. One of the most quoted scriptures, quoted verses of scripture in our culture, is God helps those who what? help themselves. It's a perfect little Bible verse. goes great on a bumper sticker. It's nice for a Facebook status or a tweet. Uh, you can probably even find some discounted wall art at Hobby Lobby with that on it. But here's the thing. It's not in the Bible anywhere. It's not a Bible verse. And yet, that's the, the one that everybody seems to go to. And I'd be so bold as to say that the very sentiment that God helps those who help themselves that runs contrary to really the entire witness of Scripture. But somehow, somewhere along the way, we began believing that faith was something we have to do alone. We started talking about a personal Lord and Savior, another phrase that's nowhere in Scripture. We started talking about an individual faith. We started using phrases like the private individual practice of religion. We became convinced that being a Christian was something that we can do on our own, that we don't need anybody else. We don't need the trappings of corporate worship and communal living. I can worship God by myself. Is it any wonder that one of the largest growing religious groups now are the spiritual but not religious folks? It's even a common identifier for many people who call themselves Christians. As we formed this individualistic faith, we ignored the full reality of who Jesus is. We turned him into sort of a spiritual superman, a, a mystical deity that only exists as a way for us to go to heaven after we die. We celebrated Easter as if it were a little more than just another holiday where you buy some nice new clothes and decorate in pastel colors. We ignored the realities of our own faults and sins, choosing instead to point out the sins of others so we could retreat further into our singular, individualized religions. And the process, the process of creating this isolated faith, I'm afraid we may have compromised the full truth of the good news by watering it down to some, con some customized contract of comfort, a personal promise of paradise. Now, in many ways, that's the sort of conflict that was corroding the community to whom John writes this first epistle. It's early in the history of the church. Uh, doctrines, confessions of faith, those things are still at least a couple of centuries away. 
And so all manner of, of thoughts, all manner of sects and groups were emerging. And some of the most notable, two of the most notable, were the Gnostics and the Docetics. Now the Gnostics believed that existence was divided between the material world and the spiritual world. And the goal of existence was to be freed from the material world. They believed that this body, along with all of creation, not that it was tainted or broken and needed to be fixed, but that it was evil. And therefore, for Gnostic Christians, they believed that Jesus actually had shown them the way to be freed from this world through some secret knowledge that he shared with just a few people. And then the Docetics, their, their title comes from the Greek word that means illusions. The Docetics believed that Jesus, Jesus was actually never really human in the first place, that he only sort of appeared to be human. Therefore, he only sort of appeared to suffer and die. Now, in the early centuries of the church, both Gnosticism and Docetism have been renounced as heresies, but still Gnosticism sort of finds its way seeking, seeping back into modern-day Christianity. Now, it's likely these two movements, Gnosticism, Docetism, along with some others, were gaining traction in this community, likely at Ephesus. And their teachings were causing disunity and leading believers astray. And that's why when, when the author starts writing this letter, he doesn't do it the normal way, not like, dear brothers and so-and-sos, and I come, think. No, he starts right away with a declaration in verses 1 through 4. These verses are a declaration of the nature of Christ, a declaration of an eyewitness. Jesus didn't seem to be human. He wasn't an illusion. He wasn't a corrupted shell encasing some knowledge-wielding spirit. He was real. He was flesh and blood and bone. He had a voice, a real presence among his disciples, among his friends. And Christ's real presence brings joy among those who have fellowship with him, those who have fellowship with each other. If he had been an illusion, a hollow body, and the folks couldn't have a real fellowship with him. We couldn't trust that kind of Jesus to know what it feels like to be us. That's why the author says in verse 4 that we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete, so that you'll understand that the Jesus that's real isn't this singular Jesus who's sort of made up an illusion, who sort of coaxes you into this individualized faith. He wants the community to know and understand that faith in the real Christ is a faith of fellowship and joy, not individualism and longing to escape from this world. Now this notion, this notion that we don't need any help, that we can do things on our own, that the point of all of this is to one day be freed from it, can lead us to a place, and the author knew this well, can lead us to a place where we believe you know what, if I can do this, then I don't need God. It can bring us to a place where we're so convinced of our own power to free ourselves, whether it's we, we pray the right prayers, we say the right things, we do the right things, we, we, we know the right stuff. We can become so convinced in our own power that we may even begin to think that we can free ourselves from sin's corruption. But surely... Surely you and I, all of us in here, we know better, don't we? Sometimes I'm not so sure. Sometimes it seems we've become so positive about our own power, of our own ability to do what's right, especially in light of the wrong we see other people doing, that we treat Christ as nothing more than a ticket, a sort of proof of purchase that we can, we can show to the one manning the door to get in to wherever it is we think we're going. We treat sin as if that's something those people do. Or, or maybe I used to do it, but I've since outgrown that now. I'm a mature person. I don't sin. We think we can do all the right stuff all by ourselves. That we don't need any help. That's why I think we need to listen again to the words before us in the words of verses 5 through 10. These are not words that testify to the customized faith of one who says, I can worship God all by myself. 
These are not the words that testify to an individualized ideology of one who worships at the altar of their own achievements and proclaims that they themselves are worthy of the rewards of heaven. These are not words that testify to the stubborn pride and self-righteousness of those who declare their worth in the light of others' sins and shortcomings. When we walk alone, when we say we don't need any help, that's what we're doing. We walk alone. And when we walk alone, we walk in the dark. Because we walk without God. Because God is light. To say we don't need help, to say we can do it on our own, to say it's all about me. Friends, I'm going to tell you, that's the ultimate sin. That is sin. It's to rebel against the very nature of who God is. And if we say, well, that's not sin. We don't sin. I don't have any sin. What we're really saying is that we don't need God in the first place. That we don't need a God in Christ whose love has overcome sin that we cannot overcome on our own. We declare that, you know what, this love stuff, that's fine. We don't need that, though. I don't need love. Love is for those people who are too weak to admit that they can't fix it on their own. It's for those people who, who don't like the rules and the regulations and the laws that I can follow. Love is for the weak people. And we say we don't need God. When we think we can do it on our own, what we're saying is we don't need love because we don't sin. But if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We sin. And there's power in that confession to say, I need something besides myself. I need something outside of myself. And this confession isn't an act we do to ensure that when that day arrives, we'll be free from judgment and damnation. No, it's something we do in order to live in relationship with God and with each other. If we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. This life of faith isn't something we do on our own. It isn't something we do on our own because, folks, we can't do it on our own. We need Christ. We need God. And here's the thing. We need each other. And are any of us perfect? <laughs> if you think you are, you deceive yourself. No. Each and every one of us in here are going to make mistakes. And each and every one of us in here at some point will likely hurt someone else. We'll sin. We'll sin against God and we'll sin against each other. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only. That's a key word there, I think. Not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. We need each other. We can't do this thing by ourselves. And maybe you've tried it. Maybe you're still trying it. Maybe you're so puffed up, you think, no, no, I can, I can do this by myself. I don't need you. I'm just here to fulfill an obligation. Maybe you've been trying to do it all alone. Maybe you've been coaxed by the belief that, that self-sufficiency is the ultimate sign of perfection. That doing everything by yourself is the way it's supposed to be. Maybe you've been walking in the dark alone for so long, you actually forgot what the light looks like. That you forgot what the light of the love of God looks like, even in a flawed fellowship such as this one. I invite you today, if you've been trying it by yourself for so long, I don't need any help, I can do it all by myself. If that's you, I invite you today to step out of that lonely darkness and in the light of God's love and the fellowship of the church. And it ain't perfect. You may not like all of it. If I can be honest with you, I don't like all of it. But it's better than walking alone. May we all come together, confess our sins together, our selfishness, and realize that is the exact opposite of what God wants for us. 
to get over this idea that what we're trying to be saved from is, is an angry God, and that really what Christ has saved us from is ourselves and our selfishness. Let's get over believing we can do it all by ourselves. Let's confess our sins together. Live in fellowship and walk in the light of God's love and the holy fellowship He has for us here and now. Because that's where He is. We said it last week, He's risen. He didn't just disappear and say, hey, I'm not going to be with you anymore. He's here with us now. Longing for us to realize we can't do it by ourselves. Because we need help. We need God's help. We need each other. Because we can't do this thing, this life, this faith. We can't do it alone. May God help us all. And may we help each other. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, our friend, our Savior, our Lord. Lord, as we come into this place this morning, we trust that you are here with us. And Lord, we pray that you make us mindful of the ways in which, Lord, we feel we can get by on our own, that we don't need any help. Make us mindful of those sins, Lord, that we may confess them this morning. Confess them in the midst of this community that you've given us, of this loving place, God where your spirit resides. Help us, Lord, to confess our sins, to realize, Lord, that we need each other and that we need you. Be with us now, O Christ. Be with us, Holy Spirit. Move in our presence, we pray. In the holy name of our Lord and our friend Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is uh, hymn number 350, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, uh, first and second stanzas. Please stand as we sing. As you go out from this place this morning, may you not leave alone. May you leave with the presence of Christ within you, the presence of Christ before you, the presence of Christ going after you. And may you leave knowing that your presence in this place is special to each one who's here. Would you pray with me? Lord, go with us now. Go with us as we go together. We pray as we go out into this world that you give us the power to be your people. In your name we pray. Amen.